Good afternoon, all, sir. Thank you for joining this event. Uh, first of all, please allow me to welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today in today's webinar. My name is uh, Ram Sandipam Adhikari, and I am heading the Ash uh, Marketing Function of Vedanta. I am based out of Jharsuguda uh, in Odisha. Uh, in today's webinar, we shall be presenting sustainable development of uh, future with flyers and red mud in association with uh, Vedanta Limited Aluminium. Today, we have two eminent speakers uh, and industry stalwarts from the cement industry, Mr. Siris Kadilkar and Mr. Robin De Beer, who will focus on sustainability and cost optimization in the cement industry using fly ash and bauxite residue, commonly known as red mud. <clears throat> like any other business, uh, the cement industry is also striving to reduce its carbon footprint. So there is an urgent requirement uh, to use low carbon materials to protect our environment, conserve natural resources, and support the circular economy. Thus, we firmly believe the webinar will provide you all with uh, more interesting insights about how fly ash and bauxite residue can uh, improve those parts with the industry experts. Just a little bit of setting the ground loose. Uh, during the presentations, uh, if you have any questions, please put them into Zoom uh, uh, question and answer box. We shall take the one by one during the uh, after the presentation is done. So uh, without any further ado, please allow me to invite one of the tallest leaders in the industry and a true champion of sustainable practices, Mr. Rahul Sarma, Chief Executive Officer of Vedanta Limited Aluminium Business to deliver the welcome address and set the context. Over to you, sir. Oh, thanks, Ram. And uh, once again, you know, good afternoon, everyone. And on behalf of Vedanta Aluminium Business, I extend a very warm welcome to the entire uh, Indian cement industry. And also our renowned uh, experts, Mr. Robin D. Beer and Mr. Sirish Kajalkar. I would have loved if I could have, you know, invited you to visit our site and be on our operation and see that, you know, uh, what kind of operation we are running in a more, uh, you know, more sustainable manner. And uh, we could have planned this workshop there. But nevertheless, I think uh, uh, this is an area which we, is, you know, we are looking quite seriously in our journey and that's our whole objective to you know have this uh, webinar and i'm really grateful to all of you but in light of the present scenario i'm glad the digital technology have brought us together on one platform today we will talk about the single most important business imperative for any manufacturing company and that is ensuring business sustainability through circular economy as india largest producer of aluminium, the metal of future, sustainable value creation is embedded in the way we run our operation and conduct our operations. Aluminium is critical to India, global aspiration with the application in important industries, sector like aviation, automobiles, electrical vehicle, building, construction, electricity, and renewable energy. We take immense pride in our technical proveness in aluminium and a deep commitment to was ensuring sustainable growth of our business, keeping the society, environment, and the economy at the heart of our aspiration. Zero harm, zero waste, and zero discharge form the underlying principle that guide our business operations. With zero waste at heart of all of our waste to wealth initiative, we are ded dedicatedly working on exploring avenues for gaining utilization of fly ash and bauxite residue, two of our most important byproduct volume wise. We have already laid the groundwork for establishing circular economy value chain for the fly ash and the bauxite residue. And in this journey, I, just to give a you know, very high level snapshot in the last uh, fiscal, we have supplied over 3 lakh ton of fly ash to various cement plant in India. Since, 2000, uh, since Feb 2021, we have also supplied over 30,000 metric tons to the bauxite residual to them also, which is the cement industry. What we are trying to do now is, in, is increase the level of awareness in the industry on the sustainability benefit of fly ash and bauxite residue with the hope that 
we can partner in this innovative solution. In this regard, we are keen for a long-term strategic collaboration between Vedanta and India's key cement producer. We believe this will not only eliminate significant volume of industry waste from the system, but also provide the quality, cost, and sustainability benefit to the industry. We hope we establish a mutually beneficial relationship for a true win-win scenario for both the industry and the environment. I once again thank you all for coming to this webinar and I hope you take back food for the thought and please reach out to our team for any queries that you may have. I would also love to stay longer for this webinar, but because of my other commitment, I may not be in position to uh, be here for a long time, but I can assure you and give my personal commitment as a Vedanta, we are a responsible industry. We are, we are fully committed on this journey, on this path to see that on the circular economy and ways to wealth, and more so how the carbon footprint can, you know, we can, uh, we can play a role. I see that jointly we can work together. I understand that when you talk about this kind of relationship or the collaboration, there are something which cannot be answered, but we are always open for any discussion. We invite you to come and visit our plant. Our team is always available and our objective remains the same. I think as a country, how we are looking in the journey, in the path for the carbon emission, which is a target, a goal, which we have set. I'm pretty sure that like aluminum, cement industry also had the same goal, same, uh, same drive for the same. And we both as jointly can work together to make this happen. And with this, I would like to give my best compliment and uh, my special thanks to the experts and all the members who has present here. And uh, we'll be looking, you know, what whatever is the takeaway, the outcome that becomes, you know, for us uh, going forward as a next step and look forward for your support. And uh, from Vedanta side, I can personally commit. This is one of my passion and drive, which we would like to drive and uh, take it forward. And once again, thanks for your, uh, you know, all of your time. I won't take much time, but uh, my my heartiest, you know, uh, compliments to all of you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your in insightful uh, words, sir. And uh, I think uh, we have got a registration of more than 200 and we can see already there are 122 participants they have joined. So uh, it will be very uh, enthusiastic discussion that we are going to take it forward. And uh, definitely, sir, uh, with your guidance, we will... Uh, go for a longer journey together. Thank you very much, sir, for your welcome address. Uh, I would just like a few minutes of audience time. I would just present uh, on behalf of Vedanta how uh, we are take, trying to take this forward. So, uh, so uh, first of all, something about us. Uh, Vedanta Limited is the world's sixth largest uh, diversified natural resource conglomerate with uh, business operation in India, South Africa, Nambia, Australia. And uh, we operate with oil, gas, zinc, lead, silver, copper, aluminium, steel, and iron ore, and of course with power. Vedanta contributes close to 1% of India's GDP as per the IFC, and we are investing around $9 million per capital projects over the next two through three years time frame. Vedanta's aluminum and power business is India's largest primary aluminum produce, producer with an installed capacity of close to 2.2 million tons. Our core purpose is to create a long-term value for all our stakeholders through research, discovery, acquisition, sustainable development, and utilization of diversified natural resources. To accomplishing that, we empower our people to drive excellence, innovation, and we demonstrate world-class standards of governance, safety, sustainability, and social responsibility. Our core values include trust, entrepreneurship, innovation, excellence, integrity, care, and respect. As I said in the last slide, our operations is a diversified portfolio that we have. It spreads across India, Sri Lanka, Ireland, Australia, and Africa. And we operate uh, in aluminum, zinc, lead, and silver, copper, iron ore, oil and gas, and power. Of course, all are associated with its uh, captive thermal power plants. 
talking about more on to operations in india for the aluminium business we have basically three divisions in uh, our portfolio first is a uh, bharat aluminium company commonly known as balco and uh, it's uh, situated in korba chatisgarh it in houses a capacity of 0.575 million metric ton uh, annually and it is associated with a 2000 megawatt of power plant this power plant generates around 4.5 million ton fly ash every year second is uh, vedanta aluminiums uh, jharsugada location plant it is in odisha state it uh, in houses a 1.6 million tons of aluminum smelter and uh, it is supported with a 3600 megawatt of power plant it generates close to 9 million ton of fly ash every year and there is a refinery operation in uh, danjigarh again in odisha which is a capacity of around uh, 2 million tons aluminum refinery and uh, it has a it generates around 3 million tons of red mud every year so uh, now let me pl uh, please uh, allow me to introduce uh, mr robin d beer we are honored to have him uh, he is a concrete technologist from south africa with uh, more than 40 years of experience he has been the general manager for as resources south africa which is a pioneer uh, in uh, gainful utilization of beneficiation of fly ash in concrete he is also been a general manager with russell kamaya uh, cement plant in uae and is now working with uh, jc uh which who is a market leader in uh, cement uh, and processing exports in india robin has been instrumental in uh, educating the market working with government bodies consultants and ready mix concrete producers to help them use flyers on sustainable and durable cost optimized construction basis so robin the stage is all yours please thank you Thank you and good morning. Um, I'm speaking to you at the moment from Cape Town, South Africa. It's a very chilly morning, and uh, let's hope we can get through this and we can give you some information about the fly ash, uh, about cost optimization, and uh, use uses in cement and in concrete. We guess this is what we're going to go through: uh, basics of fly ash. I think everybody knows about it, but we'll just reinforce it. Uh, technical advantages of fly ash, fly ash in blended cements, and applications of uh, fly ash that we've used around the world. Um, before we start on on where it comes from, um, I'd like to just say that JC has a very large pool of different fly ashes. Um, we don't just make one fly ash; we have several of them. The fly ash comes out, we classify it, we bring it to a certain uh, size fraction. that is going to give us the best water reduction we also then have what we call runoff station that will be raw fly ash that goes into road building and into embankments uh we also have a ultra fine fly ash which is about 5 microns in size it gives you the same uh, workability and uh, strength gain that you would get out of a uh, micro silica or metacalin we have what we call pos sand that's a certain fraction that goes into brick and block manufacture manufacture where you can replace some of or all of your sand depending on what you're using and of course this fly ash to be used with uh, the the bauxite residue for inter grinding in in the mills and my colleague will later talk about that um on the box side i i don't know much about it so it will be very interesting for me to listen to that presentation so let's go on and have a look uh, fly ash uh, originally was used uh, it's a it's a pozzolanic material and it came from um, um eruptions um and so you used to you would get the ash coming out of a volcanic eruption and there's many long term um uh, usages of this the colosseum uh, in in rome has been uh, standing that was all used with fly ash today though we have our own um, volcanic um, uh, um set up inside the um, the volcano the power plant 
So as you, as you can see at the bottom, we bring the fly, the coal in. The coal is then ground to a very fine uh, fraction. It's blown into the boiler. It's uh, burnt and then comes out and falls into the electric precipitators. Um, there are usually five to seven of these in a power station and each has a different size falling into it. So what we do is capture the whole lot. We then put it through a, a, a classifier if we need be, or we, as I said, we sell it for different uh, applications. It's a pozzolanic material, which means it's a, it's a two-stage cementing action. So we'll go through that a bit later, but it first sets up, it takes, uh, waits for um, some alumina to come through, some free lime, it will then react with that in seven days and that's where you get the second reaction from it. And it's very ball bearing like in, in, um, in practice. You can see on the photograph, it's rounded. It acts like a million little ball bearings in your concrete to give you a um, slump or to help uh, fill in all the gaps. This is what we're trying to get back to, you know, in cement, when we're doing concrete, we have uh, the, your stone, you have then sand, and you grade those properly to give you a very good grading. And what we're trying to do with the cement portion of it and the cementitious portion of it is to actually fill in those gaps so it makes it even finer uh, right down to the nanometers. So you'd have Portland cement, then we could add the fly ash would come in at about 25 microns. The ultra fine fly ash would come in at five. And then you could have silica fume or you could have red mud or many other things to try and fill that gap right down to the very smallest point so that we have a very dense matrix in the concrete for long-term durability. If we look at the schematic here, it's just showing you that the fine, finer the fly ash, the more it sits between the cement particles. These uh, particles are um, then uh, taking up the place where water would act or be, and so reduces your water demand. The coarser you make fly ash, the more it pushes the cement particles apart and you increase the water uh, content. So, we, that's why we don't like to take all the fly ash um, and put it into concrete. We would rather then put it through the grinding uh, machine, through the uh, cement mill and, and grind it finer. And then it would act in the same method. The way it works, we said you, you add cement and water together, you get a, a, a calcium silicate hydrate but you also get a calcium hydroxide or free lime, which is an unstable part of your cementing action or your concrete. This um, calcium hydroxide or free lime then will react with the water or with the fly ash to give you more calcium silicate hydrates. So this is where we talk about the two stage of cementing action. So it will set up um, this um, for maybe three to seven days. It will start the reaction of the cement. And then when we get the free lime at seven days and onward, that will react with your fly ash and it will fill in any little uh, areas that have not been filled with the cementing action. So here, thereby making your matrix of your concrete very, very fine and giving you long durability. So the technical advantages of the fly ash there are many, especially for sustainable building. You know, we, the fly ash is a byproduct and does not require energy uh, afterwards and uh, as it is with cement. So you have a lot of, as we talked about, if you can, you grind your, your fly ash down or you utilize it as, through a classifier, you can save a lot of, uh, sorry, firstly, you can save a lot of water if you can see there, 90 uh, gallons of water per uh, ton of flies used. You can also um, save CO2 emissions. You know, cement mills are putting out about 850 um, tons, uh, uh, kilograms for every ton of cement of CO2 emissions. Obviously, if you can replace that with 30%, it's gonna bring down your CO2 emissions. 
Again, you can save on, uh, um, on your BTU per ton of flies used, which is again a big saving. And Flyish, as we know, is used and accredited by the U.S. Green Building uh, Council under the LEED certification program. And many countries like uh, the UAE, in all their government uh, buildings and that, they actually specify that you have to have a cementitious material in there to reduce the, the carbon emissions. And it works in all different aspects of your concrete. Your concrete in the fresh concrete, it e increases the cohesion, so your pumpability is better. It, it can increase the workability of a given mix. It reduces the heat of hydration because of that two-stage cementing. It reduces the water demand and reduces bleed and segregation. The, in the durability, it increases the the redu uh, this, the re it reduces the increase of sea uh, water, salt water, which we know goes in and, and, and attacks the steel. So it stops that. It's very good for sulfide resistance, reduces permeability, and reduces alkali silica reaction, which is what in Cape Town, where I live, that's a very big problem we have with our aggregate. And in the hardened state, it increases long-term strength and stability. We have done trials here where they did an uh, ex accelerated, um, aggressive chloride induction into um, concrete. And we found that by adding 30% fly ash, you can increase your, uh, your life of your, uh, your concrete by at least six times. So if you're getting 15, 20 years out of your normal OPC, you will increase that by six times its lifespan. So the costing in the lifespan, it's very important to, to take that into consideration. It reduces the thermal and drying shrinkage of your concrete, reduces corrosion to the steel, as we said, and uh, creep in the long term. Just again, to show you um, how, we, how it works, the more, the finer you get, the less water you need, which is a, is, is a major selling point of, of classified flash versus unclassified flash. So you can see the blue uh, unclassified uh, line at the top. If you have an OPC concrete, you might add 190 liters of water per cubic meter. You use an unclassified flash, you'll have to use more like 200 liters of, of water. So that increases the cost of your concrete. Whereas if you use a classified version at 30 or 50% replacement, you can reduce your water content down to maybe 170. Now, if you work on your water cement ratio there, you'll see that you're gonna save maybe in some places up to 35, 40 kilograms of cement to give you the same strength of concrete. So it's a very good way of using less concrete and obviously less CO2 emissions being put out. There also, as we said, heat of hydration, and you can see the OPC, and this is again in the South African context, we're getting about 70 degrees with OPC, but you can see with a 30 and a 40% replacement, we reduce that heat of hydration, but not only reduce it in heat, we also make it arrive later. So by the, the, your peak temperature arriving later, you're increasing the, the tensile strengths. And so the tensile strengths then can uh, overcome that uh, uh, um, cracking moment, the thermal cracking. Again, this just shows you that the, the more you flies you put in, the greater the, um, or the better it is for chloride ingress. Uh, you can see at the bottom there, 50% is giving you a much lower um, chloride ingress than you're getting at 30%. Something that is not very well known in fly ash, and, you can, and this should be sold as it's a big selling point for flies. If you can see on the left-hand side, that's a standard laboratory cure. So you're taking your cubes and you're putting it in the laboratory curing tank, which is about 28 degrees. 
you can see that's the typical um, OPC curve, um, higher at three and seven days, but flies catching it at 28 days. But when you, if you pour a one cubic meter concrete mix into a box, both flies and then another one for uh, OPC or ordinary Portland cement, and you put a thermal couple into that, you will find that the flyage reacts to heat. It loves heat because it's burnt at 1400 degrees. And you can see the three days, seven days are really taken up. So it's, it's giving an unclear picture when you put flyage into a 28 degree bath, as opposed to when you are actually getting an in-situ setup. So it's something that it must be looked at um, and you can save quite a lot of um, um, cement again uh, using this method. Again, we just uh, long-term strength and durability and just trying to show you how the compacted, how it sits between the different um, cement and stone to give you a much better compaction and long-term durability. This is just a, a mixed design we did. This was actually done in Myanmar and we had very good aggregates there. And we've, you can see the difference here is in the water content and your strength gain. So all we did was we got a, uh, which is not really normal. We got a 30 liter water reduction, which is, which is quite, quite uh, a lot. Um, sorry, not a, um, a 20 liters water reduction. But you can see what it did to the strength. It kicked it up at 28 days. The three and seven days are nearly the same, but obviously the seven days we are waiting for that reaction with the free lime. That starts at seven days and then it takes off. So we, we it it doesn't always work like this, but you should get the um, BASF, uh, uh, sorry, ENBS 450 um, S tells you that Classified fly should give you 95% of your strength, minimum of 95% of your strength at 28 days. Fly in blended cements. Now we've done this in many different uh, formats uh, around the world again. And uh, by doing blending it in or into grinding it, you reduce the clinker by 35% or more. Obviously, that's going to reduce the carbon emissions, increases the capacity uh, capacity for low cap lower capex, uh, improves quality and standard deviations. That's how we got started in South Africa many years ago. We utilized the reduction in the standard deviation. Technical advantages like improved durability, low water demand, and workability, which we've already been through. Now the difference between the two is obviously ordinary Portland cement will give you a life cycle of about 10 to 15 years before you get the first cracking uh, problems. With flash, as we said before, you can get up to six to eight times that durability. No water reduction when you're using just ordinary Portland cement, often depending on how far they grind it, more uh, water. With a flyage, you're going to get 10 to 15% reduction, which is going to give you a saving. Very, um, very average. The OPC, ordinary Portland cement, is very average against chloride and sulfate, where flyage is obviously excellent for the both of them. And the heat of hydration in um, ordinary Portland cement is uh, at a greater risk of cracking because it's not reducing any of the heat. Three ways of looking at blending plants or producing uh, blend, blends is the intergrinding with clinker. That's maybe your cheapest option. Um, often a, the, the, one of the problems is how you um, get it into the, the mill, how you place it into the clinker. Um, there's many ways you can do that. You buy, you'll have to put up a silo and then obviously um, it is taken in and put on top of the the clinker as it goes into the mill. You can have an integrated blending plant. That's what we use more than ever is we add this at the end of the mill. So if you're making a million tons of cement 
At the end of the day, we put a blending station at the back. So as your cement comes out, we add 30% flash with it. And that increases uh, your capacity to 1.3 million tons. Um, quick payback period, uh, the best uh, method, I think, because you're blending it through and uh, one of the uh, second cheapest method, I would think. The standalone blending plant is, uh, we'll go through that just now, it's where you have, say, a cement plant and the one side of a city and a flyers plant on the other side of the city and you want to bring them together and then have a blending plant standing alone to supply a blended cement to that city. And I'll show you uh, something on that in the next two minutes. Um, this is a standalone uh, plant that we put up in, uh, in um, no, sorry, this is an integrated plant, it's Russell Kheimer. One of their big problems, they built the plant to do 1.3 million tons and they could only um, do 1 million tons because the conveying system uh, could only do 1 million tons. So we, what we did was put a cutout at the end of the, the, the system where you're producing the, the cement and we brought it down a very long uh, slide, air slide into this blending plant. Um, so if you wanted to move the cement straight through the blending plant and into the silo, you could. So A, we increased the potential to make cement by 300,000 tons a year. And secondly, we can go through the blending plant, which was uh, then also increasing your total output. So that was in Russell Hamer in the UAE, still uh, working today. This is just a schematic again of it. Uh, I'm sure you'll get a copy of it if you want to look through it, but it just gives you a, a big option. Uh, we increased this plant almost to 1.5 million tons a year um, by, by doing this, by adding the external blending plant. This was a blending plant in South Africa, in Johannesburg. Um, the, the cement is made, as you can see on the left-hand side in Northwest, it's a, a province outside of Gauteng, which is where Johannesburg is situated. And if you look at the, at the bottom of the um, map, you can see there's a little city called Funderbell Park. So the cement comes from the Northwest, from the left-hand side of the setup, and it's brought into Johannesburg. And we bring the flies from the south of Johannesburg and it is then blended in a big blending plant just on the outskirts of Janusburg. So that, that paid us to do that that way because it was the, the most optical op option that we had. Just to run through a few of the applications we've done on fly ash. Uh, fly ash is used in cer ceramic tiles all the way through to refractory bricks. Uh, Paving blocks, you can see yourself, it's very, very widely used in, in different aspects of, of cement and concrete. Advantages, obviously, in buildings and structures is, is pumpability, uh, workability. Um, a lot of these now being done by self-compacting concrete. Flyage is used in uh, railways. This job was in Kenya. We did all the precast um, beams there and all the bridges for the railway line that went from Mombasa up to, to Nairobi. Obviously in dams for heat of hydration, many, many dams around the world with fly ash, um, bridges across uh, um, chloride waters or seawater, uh, lots of um, done in ports, seaports and airports. We've done many, many of those. And uh, obviously also um, in road construction. Uh, we do two types of road concrete um, as, a, as a, a big thick slab, as a normal concrete um, highway. But we also do a roller compacted concrete for secondary roads, where we put the flash into the, um, the mix at about 70% and 30% flyage, and then we put it down on the road through a normal tar or black top machine. Well, that's my, as far as my uh, presentation goes. Um,
thank you for for listening and uh, i look forward to listening to the next speaker thank you so uh, thank you very much mr robin uh, i think it was a very insightful session to see the least uh, it was very uh, i would say uh, on the flyers part uh, how the technicalities work what are the technical advantages uh, and also i would say uh, the way you have taken back to our school days uh, some of the terms like heat of hydration water demand uh, how chloride impacts the uh, cement uh, properties those are really really very much uh, insightful and i am sure our audience has also must got really insightful uh, things to take it forward uh, to the audiences we are basically you know, taking up the question and answer uh, at the end of the session so we are noting down all your queries so we'll have of uh, all of them one by one in the once mr kadilkar finishes uh, so on the next speaker he needs no introduction still i we feel very privileged to welcome uh, sir uh, mr kadilkar who is a renowned technical expert from the cement industry who has been the director of quality and product development at acid cement Uh, an MSc in organic chemistry, he has more than four decades of experience with total around 150 paper published and presented in uh, different national and international forums. He has also got has six patents uh, uh, in India with different countries to his name, and has developed several innovative product technologies and processes that has enabled the entire industry to take it to the next level. He has. <clears throat> so uh, i would just uh, request mr kadilka sir to take this forward stage is all yours sir thank yes, you very much for joining yeah, thank please. you mr ram uh, i think i am audible to all can you hear me yes sir your voice is loud and clear okay okay so uh, uh, mr robin b just now referred to flyash properties many of these if they are in my slide i would be going faster so we have normally mineral components are added to opc so as to improve the durability which was referred various properties which are negative points in opc 53 or 43 concretes uh, are taken care by using mineral components either fly ash calcium clay slag here we are going to use in cement in indian standard we can go up to 35% the clinker component in the ppc can be even 60 or even slightly less than 60 maintaining fly ash at 35% how that we will be talking uh, just to bring at home the fly ash indian standards we have two types of fly ash calcareous and siliceous the slide is not visible is it i thought it was visible none of the slide uh no you just need to update that Sh share screen yeah it's already shared screen and well, even my first slide was not visible no sir oh my god i'll find out and no way is it is it visible now yes sir it's visible now is it yes is it visible yes sir okay okay and uh, so i was talking about indian standards the slide is visible now i reconfirm uh, sir i think it will be better if you can start from the beginning i think few of the slide participated might have missed yeah Mineral either positions they are react 
and or if it is egg, we call it uh, said to be cementation because it can act as a cement on its own also even in absence of uh, Portland cement. Fly ash, calcine clay, pozzolana, even fire clay bricks if they are ground. All these uh, silica fume, metacoli normally are used in concrete directly as a supplementary cementation materials. All these components when added, that's why we call them mineral components, when added to cement or concrete, finally in concrete, makes the concrete more durable compared to the Portland cement concrete, which is having, uh, as uh, Mr. Robin Beer already referred, high heat of hydration, durability is poor, we get 10 to 15 years of life before any work need to be done on the buildings. So that is where the uh, fly ash and all the mineral components come in picture. Uh, not only they increase the volume of the cement from the same clinker, but at the same time in its concrete, when used in concrete, the heat of hydration, all the other durability characteristics get added to the concrete uh, structures. And so you have a longer life. Uh, with lesser maintenance required later. Uh, I'll be referring to Indian fly ash characteristics. So just some slides are on the BIS requirements as per 2013 specifications. So we have siliceous and calcareous. Calcareous is not very much abundant except for the lignite fired uh, power plants. We get uh, lime rich uh, fly ashes. Otherwise, mostly it is a low lime class F as per the ASTM classification. But in India, uh, the lime content would be hardly one or two percent, not more than that. These specifications in terms of physical requirements, minimum blain. Now the blain required of fly ash received by the plant need not be this if they are producing the PPC by intergrinding. In intergrinding, the fly ash should be ground to the uh, fineness of the uh, PPC so as to be tested for its um, uh, for its. Uh, uh, lime reactivity, cement replacement value. So that is the provision made in the standard. In Under interblending, it should have certain minimum blend because it will be directly blended with the cement. Then we have, there are bagged fly ashes also available, directly used in uh, fly ash mortars for plastering. These bagged fly ashes also have an Indian standard. So coming back, the quality of fly ash primarily uh, generated from a power plant is governed by certain uh, parameters. One is coal, coal sources and uh, primarily not only the ash content of coal, but the ash composition of coal. Uh, whether the coal ash has alkalis, lime, Fe203, uh, uh, there is a mistake there, Fe203 is iron, uh, indicated as Fe203 and other oxides. These actually influence the mineralogy, the sphere formation in the fly ash during generation. All that uh, finally reflect on the properties of fly ash. It also depends, the fly ash characteristics depend on the coal mill grinding. In India, we have observed that uh, certain uh, power plants generate fly ash where it is a bimodal distribution. The particle size distribution shows that a, a good amount of percentage is below 20 micron, below 10 micron, a very less percentage is above 45 micron. So such a uh, circuit uh, depends on the grinding of the coal used in the pulverized fuel fired power plants because the grinding, whether it is in ball mill, whether it is VRM, E mill, that decides on the shape of the coal particle and indirectly directly decides the pulverize, uh, I mean, the fly ash particle size distribution also. And based on that particle size distribution, its usage and performance in cement and concrete depends. Uh, another very important aspect in India, Indian context and Indian uh, cement plants, primarily I'm referring to cement plants in India because there are many plants having their own boilers, uh, crushed coal fired boilers, AFBC or CFBC type, that is air circulating fluidized bed. Here the overboard temperature is 850 to 900. So what type of boiler is, what is the overboard temperature of the thermal plant, whether it is a FBC, CFBC, or whether it is a high temperature, where the fly ash particles see a temperature above 1350, 1400. Those fly ashes have a different performance. The lower temperature fly ashes have a different performance. How the fly ash is stored? Normally, ponded fly ash are said to have uh, a type of, you know, conditioning of fly ash is being referred by Professor Deal from UK. Uh, 
uh, there what what is meant by that is the smaller part the finer particle get agglomerated in the ponding process so if you have a good drying facility you are able to de deagglomerate the fly ash in intergrinding you get excellent performance in the cement and concrete but many a time these ponds of fly ash also have bottom ash going to the same pond so these uh, if you are using a pond ash in a uh, in a cement plant then you need to check that fly ash from time to time especially in terms of its reactivity and uh, water demand because if the bottom ash is contaminating it it will affect our performance of ppc this is what i meant to say a dry uh, a overbore temperature effect on water demand the lower temperature fly ashes have very high water is required so in ppc also the percentage nc if you are from a cement plant and testing in indian sanders you know the normal requ nc requirement is the water taken for motor testing it depends on nc so in a way it reflects the water demand of the ppc of the fly ash used in ppc and thereby its performance in concrete also so somewhere this is an important uh, aspect of fly ash at what temperature these are generated actually this can be verified even without the knowledge of from the power plant it can be uh, known through a xrd uh, normally it is seen in india the high temperature fly ashes have very high mullite content high quartz content and uh, you know the mullite and quartz do not participate in uh, any reaction in the cement but these particles fly ash particles with higher temperature are sintered particles they get ground in the intergrinding process and if the particle size of that ground fly ash in ppc goes below 20 micron the water demand of such a ppc is very attractive is very very much low and its performance in concrete is also much improved because of these grinding uh, optimizations of the ppc typically a fly ash already uh, some part was referred by mr robin but whether this fly ash has lime does not have lime also decides where in this ternary plot uh, it is lying as it goes towards the bottom side you get portland cement you get blast furnace slag which has calcium alumino silicate glass and silico aluminous glass has primarily a alumino silicate glass that's why it is pozzolanic it requires calcium hydroxide of the opc hydration to make it react from 3 to whatever 7 days and 28 day like that so pozzolanic and cementitious cementitious will lie to the left hand corner where you see blast furnace and op opc on the left uh, corner there whereas uh, uh, normal indian ashes lie here if the lime in fly ash is higher then it comes in between blast furnace slag and this fly ash so somewhere here it will lie these are calcium rich fly ashes in india certain power plants which are using indonesian coal which has a very high amount of lime alumina and iron in its ash so when that fly ash is generated it's a calcium alumino ferrite containing fly ash it has calcium aluminate so it is partly i would say it is more cementitious and pozzolanic together so it depends on which source which coal which grinding which power plant that would decide on the characteristic because the mineralogy of a fly ash would be as shown here i mean the important phase here is the glassy amorphous phase as i said the amorphous content decides the pozzolanic reactivity of fly ash now in the lab ball mill grinding suppose you don't have an xrd at your plant and you want to assess the different sources of fly ash what what you would do you cannot send it to somewhere for xrd and wait for 15 days so a simple you make ppcs of different fly ash at the same fineness same percentage fly ash same gypsum or so3 content in the resultant ppc and do a bis motor testing uh, and then compare the results of the ppc this is what should be followed in any cement plant which does not have an xrd if you have an xrd you can just run an xrd and know how is the fly ash and just do a one single test and know the performance in ppc and this is just to show you 1 2 3 4 5 fly ashes the physical test data which is there if you see fly ash number 2 shows 20 mp at one day fly ash number 3 shows 19.8 whereas fly ash 1 and fly ash 
so relatively lower strength these are primarily a uh, afbc cfbc type of power plant fly ashes which will reduce the strength in ppc if they are used more than 7 to 8 9% more than 10% definitely reduces the strength of one day strength early strength which is important of ppc so somewhere you will have to reduce fly ash total fly ash if you are using such a fly ash color of cement gets affected in the same manner if you have a carbon containing fly ashes different esp fields as um, mr robin was also saying if you can selectively collect a fly ash from a thermal plant and in the later fields you will get a much finer fly ash finer fly ash show excellent performance in cement also that cement in concrete or directly in concrete and the water demand gets reduced its reactivity is much better so such selective collection and usage i mean this graph shows minus 45 45 to 10 so i mean different fractions of fly ash if you see minus 10 micron if i use uh, fly ash in the ppc at 30% our strength will be very similar to a opc uh, very near to opc so such a ppc would be very much high in demand but you cannot get 10 micron fly ash uh, that much quantity so you'll have to look at even a possibility of uh, intergrinding and then uh, blending to increase the fly ash which i'll refer in the later slides this is just to run through the general compositional details of 40 thermal 40 50 thermal plants in india the silica and alumina variation in those fly ashes a amorphous a different fly ash would have a different amorphous content as can be seen in the graph here a and b one fly ash from a cpp fly ash will have more of a angular particle whereas the fly ash from a super thermal plant or a mega thermal plant would have more of a spherical uh, particles inside which will assist its performance in cement and concrete so uh, this is a comparison between ppc quality you see the one day difference the black line is with the mega thermal plant fly ash the gray line is with the uh, low temperature fly ashes so somewhere selection of fly ash is important in terms of what is the source where it is generated that itself will give us some idea and some small test in the lab we can select our fly ashes to be used in ppc in a plant carbon again has its own property if it is present in fly ash these carbon definitely influence the admixture requirements it requires more water for the same slump in concrete or more nc in cement so you take more water in your motor testing so your ppc quality in as per our bis standard testing method comes down at early sense one day three day 28 day normally does not change so much it is the early sense which appeals the market it is the early sense which requires a control in the manufacturing of ppc darker color shade in certain markets in india are attractive so people use carbon containing flash and try to get a partial dark color to it so it has a attraction in some other markets darker color is not accepted at all so finally where you are located accordingly you will have to choose whether you want to use a carbon fly ash partly to create a color otherwise it is uh, not very attractive in the remaining part of the india now uh, there are calcium rich fly ashes also which are coming what happens is when the lime is present in the fly ash composition the amorphous content the amorphous alumino silicate what i was saying which is there which is the reactive component of fly ash the class f fly ash is the low lime you see the hump of that amorphous moves towards 33 33 is of slag slag has a calcium alumino silicate glass and this is class c fly ash with higher lime uh, whenever lime increases it assists uh, in having a very reactive amorphous alumino silicate phase of fly ash it be, because it becomes a calcium alumino silicate phase so partly it generates not only pozzolanic reactivity but also a cementitious activity of that fly ash and it reflects in early ages also so that is where a lime rich nature is advantages not many fly ashes in india have lime rich most of them are deficient around 2% lime is there and so we had done some trials in our captive power plants by adding hydrated lime and we converted partly the alumino silicate phase of our fly ashes low temperature fly ashes to a calcium alumino silicate 
such a way of uh, converting a given flash in in the power plant also could be one, another way to look at improving that uh, particular fly ash reactivity reactivity and its pozzolanic behavior its behavior in cement and concrete so that's where calcium amorphous phase uh, is more reactive uh, and this is one of the important aspect if lime is present otherwise all these uh, properties which we discussed so far if we understand our fly ashes properly then it is possible to have the maximum fly ash absorption in pvc now simply fly ash doesn't decide that you require to look at clinker quality so somewhere you need to improve the clinker quality also you have to select the right uh, gypsum so improving clinker quality uh, why fly, uh, we want to reduce clinker factor naturally to increase fly ash of course increase durability on one hand but increase our volume and increase our bottom line so optimizing chemical composition of clinker is a very important aspect uh, normally this slide shows some details of uh, to be done in the uh, cement plant but otherwise the one day if it is less than 25 mpa at 300 blend in our day average clinker grinding then you require to look into your clinker properly if it is 30 mpa 29 mpa your clinker is reactive enough to achieve 35% fly ash okay now so uh, how to improve the clinker quality uh, especially when pet coke is being used as a fuel or if there is a sulfurous fuel then part of the lime in clinker actually reacts with the sulfur coming from the fuel forming calcium sulfate which gets dead burnt into the clinker uh, matrix which is useless for cement hydration so somewhere if this sulfur coming from the fuel we can trap and bring it to clinker as a soluble sulfate then it will improve the early stand properties of that clinker you may target a very good c3s but if you have higher so3 in the clinker due to the fuel then you are losing part of the lime in clinker in in the uh, uh, in formation of calcium sulfate instead of calcium instead of uh, tricalcium silicate c3s so how to remove that lime coming from the sulfate is uh, one of the ways is to add alkalis to it now alkalis are very costly sodium carbonate is very costly you can't use that so i thought on the my second topic we'll refer that again but red mud is one a, one uh, material which has composition similar to a laterite or a iron rich red ochre or partly a mixture of bauxite and iron ore can be replaced so chemically iron alumina it is a low silica material so when you use a low silica your lsf of clinker your phase formation of clinker will enhance your limestone from the mines you will be saving the quality of limestone because you will get the same clinker at a lower uh, lower lsf in clinker uh, in the limestone so use of this could be reactivity at early ages if you improve the reactivity at early ages naturally you can absorb the fly ash in a much better manner this is what is being referred if you are mdo rich or how to improve clinker reactivity if somebody is interested in this article it was published in a indian cement review uh, it is also covered in my blog you can search the blog you can see the article in detail and try to take some actions in your plant gypsum many a times what happens due to certain shutdowns in the power plant the fly ash sourcing for the plant becomes less we invariably we decrease the fly ash in ppc we improve we increase the coarseness of ppc we try to produce more and actually deteriorate the ppc performance to the customer instead of that you should have a stock of low purity gypsum so that you compensate for that fly ash shortage through using higher percentage of gypsum with lower purity so something like that can be done clinker factor can be achieved uh, lastly even uh, use of cement additives could be an option as i said you could go through the paper article in my blog another uh, thing which is similar to blending i would say that our grinding bahut bol raha yes public parishan hai volume bahut hai invariably the fly ash is suggested to be added after the mill before the separator now if the fly ash has a residue on 45 above above say 
it is advisable to add it at the inlet of the mill rather than at the outlet of the mill. This will improve its uh, grinding of the fly ash particle and take it below 20 micron during intergrinding with clinker. And is a type of uh, uh, the sphericity in the particle will be produced because the angular particles are dominating in most of the thermal plant fly ashes. Our amorphous content normally varies between only 25 to 45 percent, not more than that. Remaining is all angular crystallites. If we are grinding it properly, creating a sphericity on this particle, the water demand can be brought down in PPC and in concrete. So either a classified fly ash as Mr. Robin said, or you could use a ground fly ash also. A ground fly ash to that fineness, to less than 10 micron. We could directly blend with the PPC product, like what is shown here. It's a microfine ground fly ash, uh, which is a 98% uh, passing 10 micron. This was blended directly with PPC. See the graph. This is the PPC produced by the plant. So you add 2%, 4%, still the, the quality at early ages does not change because this fly ash gets fitted into that fraction of PPC where in intergrinding the fly ash particles are not concentrated. They are concentrating only about 20 micron, 15 micron. So I am trying to put a fly ash ground in between. Now, if you compensate, when you add fly ash directly to PPC, SO3 will come down. So you produce a PPC with higher SO3, higher gypsum. So you can add up to 6% simply by blending after the PPC product is produced. So, I mean, these are possibilities I'm referring. Not every plant can do it, but if you have a spare mill, you could look at this option also with a blender in between. So that you produce more cement from the same PPC also. And you get more PPC, something like that. And this PPC performs excellently in concrete also. I mean, this is what I thought I should refer in general. A uh, couple of things which you should remember, fly ash should be added at the mill inlet, not at the mill outlet or separator inlet, because that normally shows a higher production of 5%, but it decreases the one day strength in PPC in the plants. So somewhere optimizing a fly ash requires optimizing the clinker also. So somewhere we should put our attention not only in selecting the right fly ash, right fineness of fly ash, uh, even if you get coarse fly ash, if it is put in mill inlet, your PPC fineness should be less than 10 micron on 45, uh, le less than 10 percent on 45 micron. Then you are ensuring that the coarse fly ash gets ground to the, that size fraction in PPC where it will contribute to reduction in water demand and improved early strength and performance in concrete also. So somewhere I thought this is what I wanted to share with you. Anything we will discuss during question session, I think I can go back to the red mud usage. Again, primarily I would be referring red mud usage in cement industry. Uh, last few slides are talking about its other applications, which are also gradually gaining its uh, uh, importance and usage levels of red mud in those applications are increasing. Uh, what is red mud and how it is produced? It's a bare process. And finally, the bauxite, the alumina is extracted out and what remains as a residue after removing, filtering the aluminate rich uh, filtrate remains behind is this uh, residue, which is called as either bauxite residue or more popularly in cement industry, we call it red mud. Uh, this red mud, if you look at the composition, this is the composition of Vedanta Lanjigad red mud fly ash, uh, red mud uh, composition. Generation is around uh, 2 million tons, I think. Uh, if you look at the chemistry of it, uh, the silica is 5 to 15, it is saying, normally red mud has less than 10% silica, normally. This is the range which covers any small fluctuations in red mud. Typically, uh, different red muds available in the country and across the world, I have tried to put it here. There are two components which you should really uh, concentrate. One is alumina which will always be lower, but titania also will be there. And in a cement clinker manufacturing application, 
titania behaves like a alumina uh, and what we control alumina by ion ratio we could look at alumina plus titania so decrease the alumina in clinker if you have alumina plus titania together you will get the same performance in kiln so that is the important part the silica content uh, you see mostly it is lower if it is lower than the corrective materials like iron ore bauxite red ochre laterite whatever you are using then you are actually diluting the silica decreasing the silica in clinker thereby as i will refer in the next slides that you will be improving the c3s content of the clinker or if you don't want that much high c3s you will decrease the limestone uh, whatever lime content which you are using to make the raw mix uh, for the clinker manufacturing another and the most important aspect is the alkali levels the na2o content of red mud you see the na2o content so even if 1% is used we contribute 0.1% roughly to the clinker composition to the clinker composition so somewhere if you are using a sulfurous fuel definitely it will derive its advantage in forming alkali sulfate so couple of things of importance here its composition is similar to the corrective materials used in cement manufacturing clinker manufacturing uh, its uh, lower silica is an advantage its higher alkali is an advantage and uh, this is the mineralogy if people are interested in the mineralogy part i don't know many many participants are without the cement background so i thought i'll just rush through the cement manufacturing in short see what we are targeting in clinker portland clinker if you see right hand side clinker composition has higher lime lower silica alumina is 4 to 6 iron is 3 to 5 so if you are able to reduce the silica your lsf that is the measure for the c3s content that will increase so if c3s increases early strength property of the portland clinker will improve then alkali if you are using a sulfur fuel that would be advantages as i already said tricalcium silicate is the main component which is contributing to early strength dicalcium silicate gives the later strength uh, 28 day 50 day 90 days and so on it keeps on hydrating till the life of that particular cement eh, it, for years tricalcium aluminate contributes to early strength so you have to have a tricalcium aluminate so that gypsum which is used as a retarder also reacts to give some early strength with tricalcium aluminate calcium aluminum ferrite is just a neutral from cementitious angle typically just to see the clinker looks like that in optical microscopy alkali so3 ratio which i was referring alkali is minus chloride in the system divided by so3 this is what we should try to achieve around 1 or even alkalis can be higher than and so alkali so3 alkali is higher 1 to 1.1 uh, it could be advantages so that the sulfur totally gets balanced by alkalis as alkali sulfate this is what i was referring lsf lsf is the direct measure of higher lime content higher lime content higher c3s content so in short those without a cement background what we try to if we reduce the lsf of clinker by using siliceous corrective then what happens c3s content comes down if c3s content comes down then its early strength properties get disturbed you cannot absorb more fly ash in that type of clinker so somewhere it is related to each other this this slide tries to explain that in detail how a 1% decrease in ash content of coal uh, this much uh, you will uh, fuel consumption will increase 0.2% if your variability in silica content will affect lsf 1% increase in silica would result in 0.05% drop in raw mix and which results to decrease the c3s and decrease the quality at early ages of the clinker here uh, i've just tried to give all the compositions together you see laterite normally laterite coming to cement plants is anything about 20% silica iron ore usually is low purity because that is the cheapest bauxite if you are using it is my primarily for the alumina with small iron so somewhere we can replace some of these materials which are used by red mud Uh, proper raw mix calculation raw mix design calculation which every plant is aware of they could carry out and see cost benefit analysis vis a vis the not only cost from the material cost 
but what is the advantage produced in the clinker quality? So clinker quality advantage will give you advantage in PPC if you are manufacturing, everybody is manufacturing PPC or PSC. So you get advantage of increasing by ash. So naturally there are many other advantages from the bottom line angle. So this is a typical case study I tried to show here where bauxite, iron ore, and red mud was introduced. So you will see here 4.5% bauxite. I don't know whether my cursor is seen here uh, by you, but I am trying to show here. And iron ore 1% is replaced completely by 2.5% red mud. In this process, what we are doing, cost of bauxite we are saving. We are adding 2.5% into the alkali content of red mud. We are decreasing the silica in the raw mix. So producing a better LSF clinker. So there are many things which can happen, which will be advantageous for the clinker if a substitution is looked at. If you look at if pet coke is used as fuel, definitely it is advantageous because pet coke has around 7% sulfur plus minus 1% up to 8.5 Saudi pet coke and 9.5 sulfur. So such alkali rich characters can be useful to trap that sulfur and bring it to clinker as alkali sulfate and derive the advantage in terms of improved clinker uh, performance at the early ages. So this is one, this is another case study where a red ochre is being replaced by red mud. Again, red ochre, I will say it is lateritic composition. Uh, I can't see the things here because the photographs are, and the, the things are coming here. But if you look at it, it replaces red ochre, the alkali is increased, uh, any buildups happening due to the sulfurous fuel at the kin inlet and stopping the production or reducing the production, those buildups in cyclone and kin inlet will not happen because the sulfur will not go to the inlet, will get trapped into the clinker. So reduce the jamming tendencies by use of red mud is one of the advantages with sulfurous fuels. Uh, I was shared this with by Mr. Rajan saying that uh, this is how the red mud sales have increased over the last uh, whatever, uh, since, since 2019. Uh, I, I somehow related to the attractiveness of pet coke in manufacturing cement clinker. Uh, the pet coke was becoming a cheaper fuel. Many of the cement plants have lower grade deposits of limestone. So they were not able to achieve very good C3S in clinker, which was making the clinker much more reactive. So by using pet coke, the ash in coal is not added. The coal ash is replaced by ashless fuel on one hand. When ash is again a silica rich material, the ash absorption, even with the imported coal of 15% ash is around 1.5%. So 1.5% into 60% silica content. So it goes to around 0.7 silica gets added. If that ash doesn't come from pet coke, you get a much better uh, improved clinker quality. Main bottleneck, pet coke has very high sulfur. So what is the option? If raw material doesn't have alkalis, we need to use alkali rich corrective materials. There are two in India. Feldspar, feldspar has very high silica. Again, the load on mines will become high because you add silica, you require more of high grade limestone from your mines. Red mud, on the contrary, silica is less. So partly some of the correctives, if you replace by that, of course, there will be, I think, a cost advantage by replacing the natural corrective. You are saving on natural materials, fine. All that is okay. But cost advantage definitely will be attractive enough for the plant. Actually, additions will be attractive. And that resultant improvement in uh, clinker quality would be advantageous in blended cement clinker factor. So somewhere, this, I think, is related to pet coke becoming famous. But of late, I think last year, uh, mid. Uh, pet coke has become costlier, much costlier. Day by day, every plant is decreasing the pet coke. Now, while decreasing the pet coke, some of the plants, I mean, I am, I have many colleagues or no colleagues also, they call me. They ask me, sir, I saw, okay, I was 10th, gir gaya. 4 MPA gir gaya. I bola, I kya kar diya aap log? I hope Hindi, everybody understands. Uh, and then uh, I asked him, what happened? Any change in fuel? Sir, wo pet ko kam ho gaya abhi. Pahle hum 100% use kar rahe the. Na, abhi hum sirf 30 jata hai use kar rahe the. Kabhi 20 jata hai, kabhi 10 jata hai. Management is shouting, your clinker quality has fallen down. Your PPC mein vaya 4 taka se kam ho gaya. Kya karte ho tum log? 
अभी क्या बताए उनको कि आप पेटकोक बंद कर दिया इसलिए हो रहा है तो एक्चुअली मेनी अ टाइम द प्लांट लुक्स एट ओनली द पेटकोक कॉस्ट यू हैव टू लुक एट द टोटल कॉस्ट ऑफ प्रोड्यूसिंग द क्लिंकर एंड सीमेंट विच नॉर्मली पीपल डोंट डू सो इनवेरेबली दिस हैपन्स इन मेनी प्लांट्स दिस हैज हैपन एंड सम ऑफ द प्लांट्स and they might have had some ideas i gave some ideas to some of the plant aapka material mein alkalis kitna hai kam hai kya to red mud dal sakte ho sir red mud dal ke sulfur to nahi aa raha hai na petcock se are to sulfur dalo oh sulfur kaise dalenge to i told them there is a by product gypsum available in the market phosphor gypsum which is cheaper ya yeah, you your own gypsum you use एल्कली जो रेडमर से आएगा लेटराइट या बॉक्साइड को रिप्लेस कर सकते हैं कॉस्ट कम हो जाएगा दूसरा ये एल्कली और वो जिप्सम वाला सल्फर इस तरह से वो परसेंटेज यूज करो ताकि एल्कली एसोत्री रेशो इन द क्लिंकर जो पेटकोक से आता था वैसा का वैसा अभी आएगा पेटकोक नहीं है तो भी या कम है तो भी ट्राई टू डी वो एंड मेनी टाइम पीपल डू डेस्परेटली मेनी थिंग्स दे है to gain uh, so by doing that uh, the early strand decrease which was 4 5 mpa came down to only 1 mpa 1 1 1.5 mpa mai bol abhi bhi thoda optimize karo it normal ho jayega are bahut acha ho gaya ye to bahut acha ho jayega hamara bhi hum abhi management ko bata sakta hai pet ko kam karega to bhi hum aisa kar sakta hai red mud use karo so somewhere why i am trying to share this somewhere we need to understand our own plant materials properly if some some fuel changes what can be done we can look at it and take some small 8 hour trial 10 hour trial observe what is happening take everybody in confidence and then this whole thing can be reversed uh, even if fuel changes your clinker quality should not change how it cannot change that you have to come sit together with your people decide on such options like red mud is one of them which definitely will be useful in reducing the corrective cost also and adding alkalis to you, to your uh, clinker so that is another thing which i thought i should share was this regular then finally uh, so somewhere sulfurless fuel also red mud could be useful provided you have gypsum and definitely every plant has gypsum now whether you have by product gypsum then that is again another waste which you are using so actually you are contributing to sustainability oh high five ke liye lekin plant ke liye you are contributing to bringing back the clinker into the same quality what it was with the high sulfur fuel in assam region you have coal having sulfur uh, red mud i think is a solution to them there are some other ideas which i have shared with some plants but red mud is a primary idea which could be looked at by even those plants uh, located on sulfurous coals meghalaya and that particular region many plants are there small plants uh, single group plants they could also look at it in a proper manner so that is what i thought i should uh, share with you on red mud my own personal experience and i will not say knowledge but what can be done in a plant also both to optimize fly ash as we saw there to optimize the clinker quality and one of the aspects could be use of red mud to improve the clinker quality other applications of red mud which i thought i will be referring as said uh, there is a calcium aluminate cement possible if you are able to remove the iron content then there is a bhu indalco study which refers to aluminoferrite yes this is a aluminoferritic cement uh, it has c2s c4af that is calcium aluminoferrite and some c3a so this type eliminates c3 and c12 l7 so this definitely is a option for producing a cementitious material at time this could be brought very near to the present portland clinker only problem is color of this could be more on the brownish side or the reddish side even because it is ferrite rich it will be a red colored cement if that is acceptable to certain application this could be one of the uh, one of the usages of red mud of course uh, then we have bricks i think uh, i have done some work in bricks in my rnd uh, earlier uh, instead of using opc in fly ash bricks you could look at using red mud because the alkali coming from lime opc gives you calcium hydroxide 
or a PPC or a PSC gives you lime, hydrated lime. Uh, so instead of that, alkali are there in red mud, they could activate the fly ash type of composition, clay type of composition. So fly ash or clay with activated by red mud additions, you will have to optimize some proportions so that you can get a better brick than any uh, fired bricks uh, through only hydration, uh, steam curing. Okay, so that is uh, one thing which I thought would be a very important application. Some composites are being produced, which I referred in the slide, but uh, consumption of red mud will not be so high because this composite demand will not go overnight very high to consume more quantity of red mud. So there are some other applications I referred in literature, uh, just to share with you. Extraction of even sodium, even it can be used as a catalyst, it is being reported like that. And I think um, on the roads, we should bring red mud to road. <laughs> road means in road application. Yes, it, it can be again an alkali binder. Alkali binder for the base macadam in road making. Definitely uh, whatever small cement is added to it in base to bind clay together. I think red mud would be a very useful, cheaper alternative. And this has a plenty of potential there. This is what I referred on red mud bricks. Uh, natural bricks are also red. Fly ash bricks with red mud activation may not be that red. It will be more dominated by the fly ash color. And these, uh, this could be useful. Uh, actually aerated concrete, I don't know how many of you are aware. Uh, we normally use the alkalinity of the OPC to react the zinc so that the hydrogen gas is produced. It, moves out of the concrete and it produces porosity just like bread. You know, bread has uh, CO2 coming out. In the same way here, we have some gases coming out by the alkalinity of the OPC. This OPC alkalinity can be substituted by, I mean, this is what is done here, can be substituted by the alkalinity of the red mud. Uh, the alk alkali will react with the component and give you the porous nature of the concrete. Uh, this is uh, somewhere geopolymeric cement is another area. I think Chennai professor, uh, uh, I forgot his name. Uh, he is very active on this uh, front. Uh, normally we use sodium silicate, sodium hydroxide, sodium aluminate to create a clinkerless binder having properties sometimes much better than the Portland cement also or Portland cement concrete also. I produce one of such binders without any clinker, any cement. Uh, this alkali in red mud could be useful for that activation purpose. A slag could be activated by that. You don't require Portland cement. It will form a geopolymer. Actually, geopolymer is a word. Uh, what happens in nature, we try to make it happen without Portland cement. So that is what is primarily a simple way of defining a geopolymeric cement. You take waste, calcined clay, clay, slag, fly ash, use eliminate activation, alkali activation and create a binder. There are some binders now geopolymeric available as a small package. There is a, some buildings also erected by one of the suppliers of uh, geopolymeric cement. So red mud could be one of the, because it has a good amount of sodium hydroxide, which could be, uh, the advantage could be derived in such type of alternative cementitious system. This is what I think in short I have uh, summarized again some things uh, which my main uh, thing was on cement. This is what I think I have for sharing with you on red mud. Uh, I think I took a longer time probably, but uh, still I try to cut it short. <laughs> but if you have any questions, uh, we'll wait for that. Right, Ram? Yep. Thank you very much, sir. It was... Uh... Very, very enlightening, uh, very, very comprehensive, I would say. You have not only covered fly ash and red mud, but also taught us the non-cement guys how to make cement as well. You have uh, all the bits and corners of the nitty of the system and processes. Uh, it's covered very detailed, sir. Thank you very much for that. And uh, I think uh, now is the time to take uh, certain questions that has been posted into the question and answer box. So I would just uh, take them one by one. Uh, 
so uh, mr robin there is a question from mr sanjay chakraborty he is asking if uh, our fly ash is a radioactive in nature or is there any concern in using fly ash would you like to answer that question can you hear me yes yeah that that's been brought up many many times and uh, in fact um, drywall has as as much radioactivity as fly ash does in fact um to this end uh, the big plant in in johannesburg um where they get most of the flyers from they actually test for radioactivity and in the 20 30 years that has been going they've never found uh, any any um uh, above normal radioactivity i know there was a paper written uh but as far as i can understand and see that and and i've worked with there's no uh, lethal dosage or anything of radioactivity in it as i say it can be equivalent to a drywall um uh, gypsum type uh, drywall uh, the radioactivity process is almost the same yeah i mean just to add i mean phosphor gypsum tends to have some radioactivity but fly ash what we tested in our lab through a meter uh, is practically as good as negligible any activity was not absorbed in most of the fly ash sources which acc was using that time but phosphor gypsum tends to have some activity radioactivity measurement but it is much lower than what can affect human beings exactly what, there is uh, something, something there but very low Uh, right sir thank you very much for the answer i think uh, mr sanjay must have got his uh, input that he was asking about uh, mr amit aneja and uh, many others has also asked about what is the percentage of flyers that can be used in uh, producing ppc grade cement and if this percentage does change if they change the cement mix meaning if it is ppc or if it is opc does this mix change so can you please answer this no what yeah, i understood I Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Robin. Go no, ahead. you go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Uh, in PPC, as per Indian standard, uh, it is thirty-five percent fly ash is what is the specification demanding, uh, measured in terms of insoluble residue, and what percentage you declare on the bag also. Okay. And the test certificate which you show. Of course, indirectly it can be calculated from the insoluble residue of PPC. 35% has if you look at the standard properly has a plus minus 1 1.5% there so you could derive advantage that is one aspect a maximum 35% any change over of a product in the same mill from ppc to opc if you are uh, landing up opc having some fly ash and if it is above the limits of 5% performance improver then your license in opc will have a problem if you have opc in ppc and you have lower fly ash that is not so much of a problem it should not be less than 15% anything above 15 15 in ppc is called as ppc in indian standards i think that was your question and that is yep. the answer sure thank you, you very much the, if you look around the world uh, places like canada are using up to 50% yes sir. but in most cases there you using a, a different um, admixture to uh, to help uh, kick off the the strength game correct we have done uh, in in uh, dubai we ran a lot of tests for um, one of the universities there that were trying to be very low um, uh, carbon emissions and we went up to 60 70% and we we're getting very good strength out of it but we've also done now with a with the new um, um, level 5 or sem 5 that they brought in composite cements where you can go 35% with flash 35% with slag ggbs and then the rest would be your clinker uh, setup so yeah uh, we would be confident that 50% if you use this additive which is uh, made by i know that treso makes it maybe some of the other manufacturers make the same uh, sort of uh, product but it's not very widely used at the moment 35% at the the maximum uh, or, yeah. or norm sure uh, i think the next question originates from your last statement uh, robin 
that uh, if it is benefit, uh, why more people are not opting for it? Uh, what stops them? Uh, is it lack of awareness or how do you put it forward? Yeah, I think it's the standards need to change. You know, the standards are set there. Um, in Like in Dubai, um, all government buildings must have a minimum of 35% flyers and um, 60, 60 to 70% GGBS. So that's, you know, it all depends. And uh, the standards are taking longer to, to pick up. But I think we've been down the track where I would say the average of flyers used is 25%, not even 30%. So it's just really the standards, but that's something we're trying to change. We're trying to utilize more uh, or higher volumes, especially in roller compacted concrete. And it was very interesting listening to uh, uh, Shanice there about um, using the red mud, which uh, with the inner 70% flyers for roller compacted concrete. Yeah, in India, we have launched composite cement now, Ram. The composite yep. cement can have fly ash and slag. Slag minimum is 20%. I think fly ash is around 30%. So your yeah. clinker factor. More important is not the fly ash. The costlier material is the clinker, uh, manufacturing cost-wise. So many times, if you have touched 35, 36 fly ash in PPC uh, and you are using an imported gypsum of high purity, you will end up using gypsum only 3%. So if you use an impure gypsum, you can use 7% because standard doesn't talk about gypsum purity. Minimum purity required is 65%. So you have to think how to achieve something more for the plant, slightly out of the box or not out of the standard. You respect the standard, but you get what you want also. Think of it, there are options available. Okay. That's what I found yes, very interesting in your talk that you are, you are looking at boxard we know is the best uh, product for it, but not very many people are using it now because of the price. Yes. But you get so many better benefits from bauxite. So maybe by using the red mud and things like that, you can change that all. It's, yes. It makes a big difference to your way of thinking. Absolutely. So I would just change the subject uh, from cement here, sir. So uh, Mr. Kadilkar and Mr. Anbarasan has put out a question. If yeah. there is any uh, viable technology available to extract alumina from the fly ash? Uh, there is actually long back, there was a publication and a, a, <clears throat> a paper. Uh, I'm not getting the name of that. Uh, I did some work in R&D also that you extract alumina and the remaining material is actually clinker. Okay. okay. Uh, the, the alumina is extracted with alkali extraction. When you remove the, and some lime is also added, you sinter it together. Uh, you sinter lime, alkali, maybe red mud. <laughs> red mud came in picture now. But, uh, and fire it so that they react. The fly ash, alumina, alumino silicate, amorphous phase reacts with the lime and other things. And then finally, the alumina, alkali reacts to form sodium aluminate. Then you extract it with water. The temperatures were around 1200. So that C2S is formed. Lime and silica will form C2S. Alumina will be relieved from that structure by alkali as sodium aluminate. So you get sodium aluminate and alumina and clinker, I mean, bilitic clinker as a byproduct. I am not getting the name of that uh, author. A lot of work was done by that uh, uh, group or that uh, R&D. Uh, I did that something myself also, just to share with... Uh, the questionnaire. Okay. If I recollect it by end of today, I will tell the name of the author also. Yes. Hello. Ram, can you hear? Hello, Ram. Are you with us? Uh, <laughs> I think uh, the screen got frozen. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> So, so uh, Kadalka, sir, uh, one of the uh, questions which is coming out for red mud is uh, how we can manage the high moisture content uh, in the red mud and uh, so how, what is the maximum uh, quantity can be used in the cement industry? Come back again. Come back again. I, I remembered that name of that scientist, Dr. Grismek, if I remember. 
He can put it on Google Grismek, G R Y Z M E K. Okay. Okay. Thank I you, mean, sir. Just to that uh, person who asked the question, Zafar. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead with you. Yeah. So uh, in the red bar section, um, the questions which are coming at how to manage the uh, the high moisture content. Uh, yeah. Uh, which is coming out of the red mat. That is one uh, more <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Yeah. What I could understand from Rajan was, I mean, from you, of course, was that uh, whatever red mud is being generated has uh, no free moisture. It is the adsorbed or absorbed moisture of 23, 24 percent. It is relatively flowable, relatively. But uh, when it goes to the plant and uh, suppose it is exposed to air, it could be hygroscopic, it could rain or something like that. Normally what is done in plant, uh, if you are, want to use red mud without any problems in the hopper, uh, through a way feeder or a feed table, then the liners of the hopper, the shape of the hopper should be proper. Non-stick liners should be used in the hopper. The red mud should be blended or mixed in the gantry through crane or whatever system you, you have. Uh, by along with limestone tumbled properly and then added to the hopper. Limestone becomes a part of the raw mix and red mud goes without any problem of jamming. Another aspect which I had looked into in one of the plant was when the stacker, uh, you know, we have a stacker reclaimer of limestone. The belt which leads the limestone from the, uh, from the reclaimer goes to the mill. We created an addition system on the hopper through a wavement arrangement. So directly red mud with limestone mix was added on that hopper, it was going to the ball mill. It has to be stored. It can be added on the stockpile also if the stockpile of limestone is covered and you add it in two, three installments across the pile. Then, but if it is not covered and if it rains, you will have to stop the plant. So I would, uh, depends on whether the uh, system is covered. If it is not, you have to design your own way of mixing with limestone and using it. You got it. As you say, Jugad in in, the, in India. Okay. Uh, another one question from uh, Mr. M. K. Durai is how red mud, uh, uh, which contains uh, alumina, a 2 o 3 and uh, titanium oxide, can help in reducing the bauxite usage in raw mill? I think I referred in that slide, I just say it again in short that, you know, normally bauxite, when we use in our raw mix and clinker calculations, the Excel file or whatever software you have, the alumina in raw mix converts to alumina in clinker. And alumina comes from bauxite if your limestone is having less alumina. The extra alumina is coming from bauxite. Now, when you are putting red mud for calculation, uh, in, the, uh, in the square where you write alumina, you should take alumina plus titania of red mud. And titania column, keep it blank. And now work out as if it was alumina. Uh, because in the kiln, when burning happens, Alumina is a viscous flux. Titania is also a viscous flux. So if both together along with iron, A by F, what we say, alumina by iron modulus, uh, if you are able to do that, I think you, your kiln will not be affected. Your bauxite definitely will be partly reduced because of the alumina in red mud and because of alumina plus titania in red mud. 5%, 6%, whatever titania is there. I don't, I don't look at it as a fear. You should add it to alumina in your calculation. Okay, so uh, uh, same, uh, which is similar to the same, uh, what you can tell, the topic, Mr. Abhishek Rai and Sunil Kumar Noyak has asked whether we should take titanium oxide into liquid phase calculation when using red mud. Uh, forget about the bogus calculations, okay. Uh, look at alumina modulus, yes, please add it here. In liquid phase calculation, normally alumina is not being referred by even uh, who was that? Uh, the Bog uh, modified formula Taylor or somebody has given. He has not looked at titania. I have looked at titania because of my own personal experience. And I have seen that if you are uh, titania from the waste in AFR co-processing, uh, sometimes titania goes very high in solid waste, uh, ash. And then the clinker gets totally disturbed. When I control that titania plus alumina to as if it was alumina, my clinker became completely normal in terms of coating and yellow core and all that. 15 days the plant was troubled. I only suggested this. When implemented, our problem got sorted out, which shows that we have to look at it as a planning for A by F, alumina by ion modulus, by adding uh, titania to alumina on top. 
Uh, just like Mn two O three, if it is present, normally we should add it to the bottom uh, with Fe two O three because they both are mobile flux, whereas alumina and titania are viscous flux, and the viscosity by this ratio we are adjusting for the liquid phase to give more C three S. So if the kiln runs well, it runs well because of the right viscosity being achieved. Okay, I don't know how much I have gone across. Yeah. So another one question is uh, on the uh, research. um uh, there are some uh, uh, what can works going on in the european union to increase the red mud what you can tell usage in the cement into this close to 30 percentage uh, can you uh, shed some light on that yeah, i don't know which clinker they are manufacturing if they are making portland clinker 30% of 45% iron goes very high in iron so if they are making some special clinker which is aluminum ferrite or something like that Otherwise, thirty percent cannot be used as a raw material at all if it is Portland clinker. Okay, sir. Ah, what happens in Europe and in Southeast also? The limestone is very high in purity, unlike in India. So you require purer sandstone or a sand for silica, a purer alumina source like high alumina bauxite. Ah, in some such places, red mud also can be used instead of one point five, two point five. They can go to three point five, five point five. it all depends on the limestone composition available at that plant to produce a normal portland clinker which is uh, as a no, i mean with this phase composition okay 30% i, I don't know i like to search and find out uh, uh, okay. ram is back yeah ram back yep. uh, i think uh, just one last question to mr robin uh, as you have worked in the middle east melters uh and the cement factories uh, so mr satyanarayan das has uh, put out a question that uh, many of the uh, middle east uh, cement uh, industries are using spent portland as a substitute to coal and fuel but it is not been done in india any thought how uh, this way forward should be i i when i was there three four years ago we hadn't even started that so i i don't know spent uh, uh, ram <laughs> ram in yes. india also spent pot liners you know which has it's the uh, electro uh, the electrolytic process step mm -hmm. of alumina extraction uh, the yes. graphite uh, is the actually the waste graphite when you renew the uh, electrolyte vessel that is having fluoride f f fluorine yes. okay and that's why that can be used as a mineralizer in cement industry but spent pot liners also when some moisture falls or if you are touching it by hand there is a chance of generating cyanogen hydrogen cyanide and hydrogen cyanide is poisonous so some care has to be taken in processing that uh, spent pot liner to make it completely free of any possibility of cyanogen being produced it can be used in cement industry as a mineralizer if you refer one of my slide i talked about calcium fluoride sodium fluoride sodium silico fluoride actually spent pot liner uh, we took a trial in one of our cement plants as a fluorine enhancer it's a phase enhancer it is called as mineralizer uh, spent pot liner has graphite has uh, fuel value also it cannot be added in fuel you have to add it in raw mix since it has no volatile matter it does not matter in calciner or uh, in uh, inlet finally it burns slowly steadily and in situ calcines helps in the reactions but the fluorine component of that is what is highly advantageous if we, you are producing a portland clinker just to give you an idea at say 1400 temperature in the burning zone the burning zone temperature has to be brought down to around 1280 1300 so you save on fuel you produce a clinker with better c3s formation highly reactive provided provided if fluorine is controlled at certain levels where the clinker will not show retardation i mean this is a well studied project in manufacturing but only in india many of these spent pot spent pot liner godowns are actually um, through unauthorized means going to the shanties and uh, you know dhopadpatis and burnt as fuel which is dangerous but that is what is happening there is no structured way of actually taking it to cement plant okay absolutely sir i think uh, we got a fair bit of idea about uh, how it is to be taken forward more of a process route and a structured way forward would be a way yeah. forward to take this 
definitely i think we are out of time we are already overshoot by 15 minutes uh, i would not withhold the participants what we'll do whatever remaining questions are there we'll try to answer them to your email ids that you have registered us with and we'll get back to you surely so now uh, to conclude the session i would request uh, mr rajan babu to please uh, share the vote of thanks and uh, we can then conclude over thanks, to you sir thanks ma'am so good evening and thank you everyone for being a good listener so myself rajan babu heading the box at residue disposal innovation and utilization at vanta limited alimana refinery langridge i would like to thank our prominent uh, speakers mr rajan dever and mr shirish kadilkar for enlightening us with their knowledge today's webinar was a full of knowledge and interesting facts it gave us a deep insights into the utilization of fly ash and red mud majorly in cement industries in other sectors also i am pretty sure that the precious knowledge that our eminent speakers gave us will definitely help us in future for better utilization of fly ash and red mud management uh, in various uh, infrastructure sector and conserve natural resources with our common aim of supporting the circular economy i would also like to thank our ceo mr rahul sharma for taking out time out of this busy schedule to address everyone here next i would like to thank mr rishesh dalal from jc for helping us to organize this webinar seamlessly i thank my colleagues as well as who worked hard to make this event successful last but at not the least i would like to thank all the audience for their active participation without whom today's event would have been successful thank you all thank you thank you very much